Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebra. Today, I would like to tell you about localization or a generalization of the process of going from the integers, which we all know and I hope all like a lot, to the field of fractions, the rational numbers. And basically what I'm going to do is I take an element that I call R and I send it to an element that I call R over one. And I generalize this process of adding more and more of those elements that um, are of the form R over S. And this is called localization. So it's a generalization of fractions, of the idea of fractions. So let's just jump right into it by starting with some philosophy. So what always helps me a lot um, when I think about mathematics is that everything kind of comes in two incarnations or at least two incarnations or two different flavors of, this, of the same thing. Um, for example, a number. A number can be just an abstract symbol. The number three a priori is just an abstract symbol, right? But we are built as humans to think about the number three as being something explicit, like three apples or three triangles, if I could roll them, right? This is kind of the same concept. Um, the point is, of course, the number three can be mean much more general things. It's an abstract concept. And the same works for fractions. So here I have a fraction, which I just denote by a symbol. It's just R over S. And immediately, because we are humans, we are triggered by a picture like this. Like um, a fraction is a, a part of a whole, right? It's a division by something. So here is, is one over two, for example, because the whole, the yellow one here is of length one, right? Uh, so a fraction is dividing something. It's dividing a piece, uh, a cake into pieces, right? So here's my cake, very bad cake, but anyway, and I divide it into four pieces. So I've just discovered the concept of one over four. But for more general things like this one here, there's also a fraction. Um, I'm not sure what it means in terms of cake pictures, what x squared plus one divided by x cubed plus one actually is. So in some sense, this picture is way more general than the thing you have in mind, but a lot of things from this very classical fraction-like, cake-like picture certainly generalizes to way more um, abstract setups and way more, well, gen generalizes to way more general rings and um, multiplication rules. So, uh, but let me just repeat or recall how actually one can go from Z to Q. So. The, the idea is very, very easy. So we start with a, with a certain set of numerators. In this case, just, uh, well, everything in Z could be a numerator. Everything, if I write um, R over S, every R can be a, any integer, right? It could be five, it could be minus two, it could be zero or something like that. But S, that's some, uh, my, my denominators. Um, S can be anything except zero. If I do that, I, well, I can write down R over S. I'm not quite there. Why? Well, certainly I observed that any element in Q is of the form S inverse times R, which is the same as R over S, of course. But I just like to write S inverse because it's kind of the standard notation. So um, S inverse times R. We are not quite there yet, as I said, because, well, I could have something like eight over four which certainly wants to be the same as uh, two, I guess, <laughs> if, if I have the back calculation right. So two symbols could mean the same thing. And in order to, well, get rid of this ambiguity, what you say is, well, A over B equals R over S. So eight over four equals two, if and only if, well, let me write two over one. I can write one to this side and kind of write four to this side. So it's if and only if one times eight equals two times four, right? And I just rewrote this here. And I will tell you later why I want this slightly more general looking uh, equation. I actually want to put a T in front and I want to say they're equal if and only if there's a T such that. Uh, for going from Z to Q, it doesn't matter, but in general it will. So for now, maybe ignore it. And on my last slide, I will explain why we actually want that. Okay, so that's a nice thing to observe. You can just go to fractions by 
taking out zero and well, use some certain equivalence relation. And you observe that Q is a ring and all of you know how addition works, how multiplication works. And the zero element, if I write it like this, is something like zero over one. And the one element, if I write it like this, is one over one. Right? That's pretty standard, uh, I hope. <laughs> and um, certainly there's a map from, that's exactly the map I explained. Try to explain here, there's this map from Z to Q, which sends any R to R over one, right? If I really want to be very picky how I write my elements in Q, then I should always write a fraction and kind of identify Z with R over one. Okay, but the point is, this works in pretty much generality. For example, you can have local functions, functions close to a certain point, let's say close to zero. Uh, what can you do? Well, mimic exactly the same process. Let's say uh, you have polynomials from R to R. I give you later an example, which makes this much more precise. But that's what, I should, that's what you could call the numerators polynomials from R to R. And I really want to think of them as polynomials in, in the sense of I evaluate them somewhere at a certain point. In particular, I can't just simply divide by a polynomial because it could have a zero somewhere. And I don't want to divide by zero. But what I can do is I can take my denominators, so my set S, to be everything that is not equal to zero at my chosen point. And my chosen point in this example is zero. And that's what you would call kind of a local function uh, would be then something that is kind of of this form S inverse times an element of R because it's kind of locally well-defined around zero. Why? Well, because I have a polynomial and the, the kind of the next zero of the polynomial will be a certain, certain distance away from zero. So locally, this doesn't matter. And by locally, I can divide by my element, which is not zero at zero. And you observe that otherwise it's exactly the same process you run through, you have the same equivalence relation. In this case, I'm going to make this precise later, as I said, you really want this T here in front, but otherwise it's exactly the same process. Just keep in mind that those symbols mean something different, namely polynomial functions or this rational functions, local functions. And then you are almost there if you believe the strategy. Here you go. Here's the local localization, the definition and the, the statement. The statement that is, is, of course, that everything is well defined. So there's the process that I'm going to describe gives a ring, and you have this funny ring homomorphism, uh, sending R to R over one, which formally I just write as R, uh, as a tuple R one. You will see in a second, and this is injective. So this is just a map because it collapses certain functions, you will see, but this is injective. So it's injective if and only if my, my set S doesn't contain any zero divisors and zero divisors are exactly those elements when, when AB does not necessarily, or AB equals zero does not necessarily imply that A equals zero or B equals zero, right? So then A or either A or B is a zero divisor. It divides zero. Um, anyway, so let's ignore that for a while. Uh, so here's the construction. You actually take the set R cross S. That's why I'm writing tuples. And on R cross S, you impose the, exactly the equivalence relation I told you about, which of course just mimics the process from, from the um, rational numbers. And you take equivalence classes. That's your localization at S. Right? You invert elements in S. You just write tuples. Or because mathematicians are lazy, after you understood this uh, definition, you, instead of a tuple, as I said, you just write whatever R over S, right? This is just, should be considered as a tuple RS. And you, well, you use exactly the same uh, addition and multiplication as, as you would do for fractions. And the point is, well, you can now formally check that this defines a ring with, a, with, a, with, a, with this multiplication and this um, addition. And the zero is this element, so zero over one, and the one is this element, so one over one. And this works for any commutative ring, right? R is a commutative ring, and any multiplicatively closed set which contains the unit. You want the unit because you want to write something like this, right? 
Okay. But otherwise, you only need a multiplicatively closed set. Why do you need a multiplicatively closed set here? Well, let's have a look what your uh, denominator does. So the denominator always wants to stay in the same set. That's why you need a multiplicatively closed set. But that's basically it. You want a multiplicatively closed set and you want the unit. So let's have a look here again. Uh, obviously, this is a multiplicatively closed set, right? If you multiply a times b, then this won't be zero unless, uh, well, we are in z, right? Unless a is zero or b is zero. So this is certainly a multiplicatively closed set. And yes, one is in there. So that's fine. Let's have a look here. That's also a multiplicatively closed set. If you have a polynomial that is not zero at zero, if you multiply it by a polynomial that is not zero at zero, then you get a polynomial that is not zero at zero, right? And certainly uh, the, the unit polynomial, the constant polynomial is also in S. So that also works, right? And that's all you need. And you impose exactly the relations that you would expect from the construction going from Z or all favorite ring to Q. And, and you're done. Uh, that's a very nice construction. Let me explain um, this funny property of having the T in front and also why it's actually called localization. So what you should think is that if you have some geometric space like this X-like uh, shape um, and X, <laughs> the X-like shape, right? Um, and X is actually the vanishing set. So the zero set of this polynomial, right? If I stick in elements from R, squared into my polynomial here, they vanish exactly um, at, at this set x. And the model we usually use in algebra is something like actually um, the corresponding ring for this set x, you want to associate a ring, is polynomials modulo uh, because you have the vanishing set. So you take the ideal modu modulo, the ideal um, given by this element. And then you have your favorite point here, a, zero point lies on a. And certainly this function is indistinguishable from the zero function on the set X, right? At, locally at A. There's no way you can distinguish this function locally at A from, from uh, the zero on X because it just vanishes there, right? It's just locally indistinguishable from, from zero. So in the localization, you want this to be zero because, well, that's the whole point about localization, right? You want to look at well, that's where the name comes from. You want to look at local properties. Uh, the problem is if you just naively write down the equation that you know from the, from the rational numbers, this one, it doesn't quite work. So for rational numbers, it does work because you have, don't have any zero divisors. Here, it doesn't really work. So x minus y is not the zero function, right? It's just not the zero function. But if you allow this additional element here, this is my t. Right, uh, the, the t from from uh, here. So this t, then actually um, everything is is fine. Everything is great, and these are actually really zero. Why? Because I already have imposed the relation that x uh, that x plus y minus uh, times x minus y is zero. Right. So locally, in this localization, actually they are the same, and that's what you wanted. Okay, let me wrap up. So we have this notion of localization and this basically just means you copy the construction of the, that you know from, from the, uh, going from the integers to the rational numbers, you write fractions, you just have to be a bit careful what you like to invert. So zero is usually not a good idea to invert. Um, zero divisors are also a bit tricky, but otherwise you get exactly the same calculus. And now you can invert numbers, which is, which is pretty good. You're getting closer and closer to a calculus as you know it from, well, let's say integers or rational numbers. Okay, but that's it for today. And I hope you enjoyed the video. And of course, I hope to see you next time.